Father, we stand in your presence, Lord, and we want to thank you for making us one family through your Son, Jesus Christ, and especially giving us another opportunity, Lord, that we could come and study and learn from one another and be encouraged and edified, O oh God. This moment, we remember some of our brethren who are sick, especially we remember Ravi, who is suffering with fever, Lord. I pray that you may touch him and heal him completely and grant him your protection, O oh God. I also pray for Pearl. She is uh, uh, <clears throat> suffering with backache since more than, uh, more than a day, O oh Lord. You touch her, give her relief, and she may, so that she may be able to continue with whatever she is doing, O oh God. Remember Nelson, thank you very much for the recovery you granted him till now. And uh, still we don't know if he requires a surgery, but we pray that your special grace may be upon him so that uh, he may not require any surgery and he may recover soon. And we bless your holy name, O oh God. Thank you very much for the uh, healing Surya Murti also, Lord, and continue your grace upon him and your healing hand be upon him continuously so that uh, uh, he may be able to, uh, you know, continue in life normally, O oh God. Touch him and heal him completely and uh, be with him. Lord, thank you very much for saving Elizabeth from the uh, accident, O oh God, and still... Uh, she has the she has a tear in her shoulder. I pray that your healing hand may be upon her, and you heal her completely, and she may receive a new strength, and uh, her body and her bones and joints may be rejuvenated by your spirit, and revitalized by your spirit of God, and uh, she may be strong and especially help her in her daily chores and lead her and guide her, Lord. We commit all our members who are suffering, let your protection be around them, let your grace be around them, O oh Lord. And this moment, as we are going to study your word, I pray that uh, by your spirit, you grant us the revelation, you give us the grace, and open our hearts and minds, so that we may be able to perceive the deeper truth that you want to communicate to us, and we may be focused on you and uh, continue to grow in your knowledge, O oh God. Thank you very much for everything. Uh, Lee, everything we do, Lord, we speak, may be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Praveen. I'm sorry, I forgot to check with you if there was any prayer request that you might have had. Uh, in case you do, uh, please let us know. And maybe you can just write it in the chat box so that uh, we can, in our closing prayer, we can include that. Okay, well, we are back to creation controversies. Uh, last time we discussed uh, how the Bible should be read. It's uh, not a science textbook, and we had a very interesting discussion. And today, like I uh, posted on the, uh, on the group, uh, we are discussing what can be called the young, or young earth, old earth controversy. Uh, and even as I uh, discuss this with you, I do it not as a scientist, obviously. I do it more of a student of the Bible. And uh, uh, whatever little science I will bring in is obviously borrowed from all the experts. Uh, but I think I do have a perspective from the scriptures, which I would like to present to you. Well, let me have some fun with you uh, as we begin. I'm going to, I have three quiz questions. So let me see if, uh, how, how, how uh, accurate you are going to be in, ask, in answering these questions. All right. Question number one is, what do young earth creationists claim the earth's age to be? 6,000 years. Okay. All right. Surya Murthy, you had another answer? Oh. Same thing? 4,000 plus 2,000. <laughs> 6,000 years. Okay. So that is uh, Old Testament, New Testament, I guess. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Well, um, actually, even the 
young earth creationists don't have a, a precise figure. They, they date it between 6,000 to 10,000 years. I don't know why, but uh, they apparently give that kind of a gap. All right, question number two. What do old earth creationists and scientists say the earth's age is? Four billion dollars, four billion years. <laughs> okay, all right. I Any think other four, take 4K BC, 4K or 5K BC and odd years. Okay, you're saying billion, right? I mean, when you say BC? BC. Uh, 4,000. No, no, 4,000 something or 5,000. I forgot the first digit. 4,000 something or 5,000 something right. BC. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, thank you, Franklin, for joining us. Since you're the expert, can you tell us what the scientists say the age of the Earth is? Sir, uh, it, uh, sir it depends upon the methodology you adopt for testing, sir. Yes. Are you adopting carbon, uh, carbon dating? Uh, uh, there is no definitive answer, sir. Okay. It varies from billions of years. Right. Well, didn't I say he was the expert? <laughs> yeah, he's got a precise answer. But uh, basically, no, uh, 4.54 billion years plus or minus 50 million years. <laughs> that is according to the National Geographer. All right. Okay, here goes. One more question. One more quiz question before we get launch into it. What do the scientists say the age of the universe is? Not just the Earth, but the entire universe. 14 billion. <laughs> okay. All right. I think uh, Anil has read up. <laughs> uh, any other takers for that? <laughs> well, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the scientists say between 13 and 14 billion years, plus or minus a few billion. Okay. <laughs> So we shouldn't forget that. Okay, now, uh, it, is, it is, I don't know, ironical that this remains a raging debate amongst Christians. I mean, of all people, Christians want to debate this. And obviously, because the Bible has a certain perspective and the scientists obviously, you know, uh, you know have a totally different perspective. But... You know, in many ways, I hope that I can bring you a perspective which is a little different from many others. Uh, this debate, I must say, is based on faulty reasoning and, 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 and misnomers, okay? Uh, faulty reasoning and uh, uh, misnomers. Uh, it is basically not trying to understand the purpose for theology uh, and the purpose for science. And what happens is an unnecessary conflict is introduced between theology and science, thus uh, causing this uh, debate. In other words, it is in one sense, if I could say a false contest or maybe a straw man argument. Now, uh, uh, I don't know how to explain the straw man argument, uh, I think the best way I can put it is, you know, it's like attacking a straw man. It is uh, setting up an enemy where there is no enemy and then trying to attack an imaginary enemy. Franklin, you can correct me if I am wrong. Uh, you are the uh, English expert here. So, but uh, this is the raging debate that goes on that uh, theology and science are conflicted but on a lighter note, if I can say, uh, somebody says theology teaches people how to go to heaven, but science teaches how the heaven goes. Just on the lighter side, okay? <laughs> uh, but the main thing for us to understand is this. Science and theology investigate different realities. And what happens is when you start comparing these two, you are comparing apples and oranges. And that is where I think uh, the unfortunate, uh, uh, you know, reality lies. Now, let me move on to ask, ask the question, why is it important though to address it, even though it is a, uh, you know, a faulty sort of, you know, argument, why 
why is it important to address it? And this, unfortunately, you know, is uh, uh, sad that one of the casualties of this debate is that people are losing faith, especially young people, young people, college going, who are now beginning to, uh, you know, be introduced to science in a big way. Uh, they have access to evidences from what science is doing. And of course, science has, you know, in, uh, in, what do you say, uh, developed so, you know, so well that they tend to believe evidence-based science and they think that science is contradicting the Bible, right? They are made to conclude that the Bible is scientifically inaccurate and hence cannot be believed. So all, uh, unfortunately, all of this is based on this false uh, conflict that has been unnecessarily created by this whole debate about old earth and young earth and all of that. Okay. Let me see how we can carry on then. Let me go into what do the young earth earthers believe? Let me call them young earthers, all right? Uh, the, the, don't forget, the young earthers are those who believe that the universe is only 6,000 years old. Of course, between six and 10,000, like some would want to uh, uh, put it. What they believe is this, that Genesis 1, the creation account in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, if there is a continuation, must be read literally. All right? It must be read literally. Uh, just as we read the crucifixion, you know, when you read the crucifixion in the scriptures, don't you, don't you uh, make it literal that there was a literal crucifixion? And so similarly, uh, if the, uh, in the resurrection, uh, the, uh, what do you say, the uh, resurrection is read, read uh, literally, isn't it? That there was a bodily resurrection. So they say, why don't you put, uh, uh, apply the same rule in Genesis 1 and read it literally? And hence, you will find that there are only, uh, you know, uh, six days, literal days of creation. So that is how they argue. Uh, so they believe that six days of creation were literal 24-hour days. And hence, the universe was created in 144 hours. That's simple math. Uh, 24 hour days into 644. Okay, so they believe that you need 144 hours uh, to be injected into Genesis 1 to believe that uh, that was the length of time of creation. Does this remind you of another argument? I think Bertie will uh, probably relate to this. This days, and I remember our raging, our raging controversy Three days and three nights. You remember that, Bertie? <laughs> you know, we are still fighting over what is three days and three nights. And then there are people who say that three days and three nights, remember, that is the, that is the length of time Jesus was in the, uh, in the, in the tomb. And uh, many people or some people tend to assume that Good Friday and Easter Sunday are all false because there is no three days and three nights. So, Anyway, that's a, that's a different argument. We'll talk about it some other time. Um, so as per recorded history, according to the young earthers, the earth is only 6,000 years old or six to 10. And look at some of the theological conclusions that come out of this belief system. Uh, according to this, and looking at uh, the scripture in, uh, uh, in Peter, the, uh, the epistle of Peter, I think it is, uh, is it one or two Peter? Uh, one day is equivalent to a thousand years. You remember that, uh, that equation that, sorry, <laughs> two Peter, right? Yeah. Um, one day equals to a thousand years. So the theological conclusion is that six days of creation would mean that man has 6,000 years of uh, human uh, existence and rule or whatever you may call it. And then the time is over and the kingdom is to be established for the next 1000 years. That is one of the theological conclu conclusions the young earthers make. So 
what is the inevitable result of that? The predictions of the coming of Christ. And I am shocked. All you have to do is go into Google and, and type in uh, the next predictions of Christ's coming. And you can get about five or six different dates. <laughs> so 2021 is one. 2024 is another one, 2025. All of these are predicted to be the return of Christ. <laughs> in one sense, I wish one of them were true because, you know, we really need Christ to get, you know, come back to this earth, right? Okay, so that is what young earthers believe. What about the, uh, the old earthers? Remember, I'm just using a, a terminology just to describe uh, the belief system here. Now, the old authors say that since science and specifically geology, the science of geology says that the earth is much older according to their dating. The earth is much older. The Bible cannot contradict that scientific evidence. And so their conclusion is that the Bible uh, has to you know, agree to the scientific evidence of it being universe being billions of years old. Now, what are the evidences they say is, uh, and I'm just going to give you a few, they got many. You know, one of the things they say is, you know, look at the, uh, the tree rings in a, what is called as a deciduous tree. A deciduous tree is uh, a tree that sheds its leaves, you know, periodically. And according to, uh, you know, when they cut a tree, they found these tree rings. And according to science, each ring is one year. It takes one year for each of the tree rings to uh, form. And some of them, they found out some of the trees were more than 4,000 years old. So they believe that there is a scientific way to calculate these things. Give you, let me give you another example. The undersea coral reefs, and particularly the one in the Pacific uh, Ocean, uh, there is a scientific name for it, uh, the, the, this particular expanse of coral reef. They say it grows eight millimeters each year. If it grows eight millimeters each year and they found out that it is 4,500 feet thick. This, this coral reef you know, uh, formation is 4,500 feet thick. Thus, uh, it needs at least 180,000 years or 180,000 years for it to have reached 4,500 uh, 4, feet. So they say, how can the earth only be 6,000 years when it takes that much time for a coral reef to form, all right? One more thought, geological strata, according to uh, you know, the, uh, the discoveries that they have made, contain earth, uh, they, they contain fossil organisms, which once again, by their standards of dating, much older than 6,000 years. So the old earthers can uh, conclude that the earth is definitely billions of years old. And they tend to say Genesis chapter one, that is the creation account in Genesis one is a recreation. It is not the actual creation. It is a recreation. I think last time you remember we discussed the gap theory. So they tend to believe in this uh, uh, something called the gap theory. So they want scientific, uh, or rather the biblical account to tally with the scientific uh, evidence. Now, uh, what do we believe? <laughs> okay, now I, I'm going to just, uh, just bring out a whole lot of thoughts. Uh, remember, these, I'm just bringing out these thoughts and don't assume that they are what I believe. Uh, I want you to think about it. And I want us to then come to conclusions. So I'm going to throw out a whole lot of facts here and uh, uh, do pay attention. And uh, uh, after we conclude, I want to also play you a short video clip. Uh, and uh, it is uh, by Hugh Ross. Uh, Anil will 
remember Hugh Ross, so uh, we discussed him last time. Right? Okay, look at, let me give you some explanations here or explanations that are given by some of these people who in, indulge in these debates. Young Earthers, they say when they are confronted with the old earth theory that the earth is you know, millions of years old, billions of years old, they say just as God created the first humans as adults, all right, with the appearance of age, so also he created the earth with an appearance of being old, right? This is one of the arguments of the young earthers. When they are told, how come the earth can be so old? They say, well, Adam was created, bang, you know, just as an adult. He was not a baby and grew up. Uh, similarly, the earth and the universe was created to appear old. So it is not necessarily old. That's their thought. Now, uh, what do the old earthers say? The old earthers say that the universe, the earth and the earth were created much before the creation account in Genesis chapter 1. And the six-day period that is being described, the six-day period is actually God was making the earth functional. Right? He was actually giving it purpose and meaning. He was making it habitable for, of course, the special creation, which is humanity. All right. So that is how they explain. It's very interesting. I mean, uh, there's solid arguments on both sides. <laughs> and you sometimes you wonder, you know, who to believe. Uh, I was listening to one, uh, one theologian, and I, I forget what his name is, but he had a very interesting analogy. You know, he said, suppose you have some people come to your house and they say, you know, uh, uh, you know, we'd like to see your house. You know, I mean, uh, can you give us a tour of your house? And what would you do? You would take them to the living room and the bedroom uh, and the, bed, you know, the kitchen and where you dine, right? And you say, well, this is what we do here. And, you know, the, this is a memory we have of this room or whatever, right? In other words, they describe a home story. But you don't necessarily go and tell them, you see, this room is uh, measured in so many feet. It took so many pillars to make sure this room was. In other words, you don't describe the building in feet and meters and mortar and bricks and pillars. Do you? You don't. So this theologian says, this is called the house story. So he says, Genesis chapter one is actually describing the home story. It's not describing the house story. In other words, he's saying, Genesis chapter one does not give you scientific details of the creation. It is just showing that, you know, God is making the earth habitable for humanity. All right. Now, uh, let me bring in some problems while reading Genesis. Now I'm going in more from a theological perspective. Uh, and of course, looking at the scientific data, if you read it like a, a scientist, you will obviously find there are some, uh, you know, uh, uh, some difficulties. When you look at it from a 21st century perspective, you will obviously find some, some difficulty but you will not miss the real meaning of Genesis. You know, the Bible that way is timeless. Uh, it was written, uh, it was not written to us, but it was written for us. It was written for all of humanity, but it was written specifically to, for, for the Israelites, right? Which they could understand. Let's look at the interpretation of day. The word day in the Hebrew is yom, Y-O-N. And it has four meanings, or some people would say more than four meanings. Uh, one is, it is used to describe the 12 daylight hours, the day and the night. Okay, so day means the 12 daylight hours. Or it could mean a 24-hour period. The morning and the evening can be a day. Or it could mean the entire period of creation. For example, Genesis chapter 2 verse 4 says, 
in the day that the Lord God made heaven and earth. What is this day? In the day that the Lord God made heaven and earth. Did he make it in one day? No. That day, the usage of the word day is different from what it was used in, uh, in uh, Genesis uh, 1. And if I can just give you a teaser, uh, Hugh Ross has a very interesting thought on that. So keep uh, waiting for that video. So uh, uh, the, the, the word day has different meanings. Now let comes to the seventh day. The seventh day has no morning and evening. All the other six days has morning and evening. And the question is, therefore, how long was the seventh day? Was it morning and evening? Was it 24 hours? Well, it doesn't say. It doesn't say. So, right? so that is, you know, uh, uh, recognizing that there is a difficulty when you read and trying to understand what could, have, what could Genesis 1 mean when it talks about these things. Obviously, you look at the context and everything, but then it still creates some kind of confusion. Now, let's go to some other issues. Once again, I'm trying to show you the difficulties that we accost when we read Genesis from a scientific perspective, all right? Uh, look at the physics of creation. Genesis 1 does not give us any information with regards to how God created, right? For example, does God tell us how he separated light and darkness? How he separated land and sea? Right? He doesn't. He just, he just says that, you know, light was separated from, from darkness. All right? Now, uh, Genesis 1 was not designed to tell us whether he created aquatic in, in insects and land-dwelling insects on the same day? Does it have any mention of that? Absolutely not. It does not tell us whether the stars existed before verse 16, Genesis 1 verse 16, where it says, which is the fourth day, where it says God made two great lights, one to rule by the day and one by the night, and he also made the stars. That is what Genesis chapter 1 verse 16 says. The question is, did he make the stars on the fourth day? Well, uh, question mark, right? Now, uh, creation, when did creation begin? Morning or evening? Right? If you be literal, creation should have begun in the morning because God said, let there be light. Right? Uh, but he marks each day by saying, the evening and morning were the first day. The evening and the morning was the second day. Now, the question is, when did creation start? Well, question mark. See, when you, what I'm trying to show you is when you force a 21st century scientific perspective and you try to squeeze Genesis 1 to adhere to this, there are problems. And I must mention that it was not meant, Genesis 1 was not meant to be read in a scientific manner. Okay, let me give you some more controversy. Light and darkness. God says God separated light from darkness. Genesis 1 verse 4. Now, question. Darkness was separated only, uh, only sometime after light existed? When did he separate? Did he create darkness and light? And then he said, okay, uh, God separated light from darkness. Right? Uh, we understand that light is always separated from darkness. Right? Now, let me introduce some more crazy thoughts. What about dark material? Is darkness material? What about dark matter? What about dark energy? Genesis 1 does not have anything to say about that. And the scientists speak eloquently about it. Okay, some more thoughts. Uh, I'm, bombard I'm bombarding your mind with <laughs> all this stuff. But hang on, please. I'm going to come to a conclusion, and hopefully that will be interesting. Look at the growth of trees, all right? It says uh, after that, you know, after God, after creating all animals, 
uh, and, uh, and then created Adam. Then he says, God planted a garden in Eden, Genesis 2, this is. And it says he made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, right? Now, notice the word planted as opposed to created. So suddenly from a creator, God became a gardener. Right? Uh, the question is, how long did it take for the trees to be planted? so that it could grow, it implies time, right? How long did God wait for it to grow till he could tell Adam and Eve that don't eat of this fruit because he had to show the fruit. Was it created instantaneously or did it grow? How long did it take to grow? Well, uh, these are all, you know, big gaps. If you look at it scientifically, I'll just give you a one more controversy and then we'll go to, into the conclusions, all right? Look at the naming uh, issue. You know, remember uh, God uh, had told Adam to name all the, the beasts of the field, right? So all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air, uh, this is called taxonomy, right? The naming of uh, animals uh, is taxonomy. So this job, of, wouldn't it have taken time? Adam would have to observe the animal and then think about each one, uh, you know, and obviously it would have taken time. And then for Adam to realize he was lonely, he had nobody with him like himself, which, on, which also implies passage of time. The question is, when was Eve created? Eve was not on the scene at this time. When was Eve created? Right, Because in Genesis 1 verse 27, it says that God created male and female. Then in Genesis chapter 2, it says that Eve came much later on. Well, is there a contradiction? Well, once again, the question is, how do you read the scriptures? Okay, now I think I'll stop with you know, all these controversies that I'm throwing at you. What do we learn from this discussion? I think it's obvious, isn't it? The obvious uh, you know, conclusions we can definitely make is the Bible or Genesis chapter one and two was not designed for scientific accuracy. It was not designed, God did not design it for scientific accuracy. Genesis one does not give scientific facts. It could be scientific, but he does not give us the details. He does not give us the how of creation. Right? This Bible is simply not telling us how old the rocks are, right? Was creation done in six literal days or not? Maybe, maybe not. So the question is, what is Genesis trying to tell us? What is the creation account in Genesis trying to tell us? And here comes the theological purpose. Remember I mentioned theology and science? And God had a theological perspective in mind when he had this account written down. And the theological purpose is this. And this is where I think <clears throat> it gets very interesting. It first and foremost reveals that God is the creator. No doubts about that. That the, that the creation or the existence of the universe came because God created it, right? There is no, absolutely no doubts about that. Now look at something else very interesting. Why did God describe this creation in six days? Why did he use these six days? Perhaps some theologians believe that the six days is to tell us that this creator did it all. In other words, there was no other God like the moon God who created the moon. There was no other God like the sun God who created the sun. There was no other God like the ocean God or the sea God who created the sea. God is probably trying to tell the Israelites, remember this is written to the Israelites, that he did it all. And there is no other God beside him. There is no moon God. There is no sun God. There is no, and this is the belief system of many faiths today. 
But Genesis chapter one, perhaps using the six day theory probably means that God is trying to show that he is sovereign over all creation. He is, the, he is over all of nature. There is no lesser gods than him who did, did some you know, other creations. Each day of the six days establishes the sovereignty of God Almighty. Could that be a reason? A theological reason why six days are mentioned? And could it be a literal six days? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But that doesn't matter for me. For me, it, it, you know, for, for me, it is the fact that God Almighty did the creation. And there is no other God for us to worship. We don't have to worship a sun God. We don't, we don't have to fear a sea God. We don't have to pray to a sea God before we take a voyage. Right? Because God Almighty is sovereign. Now, this same God who created gave us minds to think, to reason, and gave us science as a means of investigating the way he created the universe and enjoy its wonder. But unfortunately, we take this science and try to disprove the creator. How foolish can human beings be? Right? Uh, uh, you know, so God gave us theology and he gave us science. Both are different forms of evidences and they give you evidence and they speak differently. They give you different kinds of evidence for, you know, the, the almighty, uh, the, the, you know, the sovereignty of God. One tells us the purpose of creation. Theology tells us the purpose of creation. Science tells us the details of how it happened. And trying to buck the two together, trying to make them enemies is unfortunate. And that is where I think uh, theologians have misled and have fallen into a pit in unnecessarily trying to fight with science. And science then trying to disprove the existence of God, which they have not done and will never do because they just cannot do that. Right? So what I wanted to mention is that we have, we will have a conflict when we think that the Bible is giving us information about science. Obviously, you'll have a conflict. But we will also have a conflict if we think that science is giving information about God. Science cannot give us information about God because God is not, you know, some material being that can be tested in a lab and laboratory. Science is very successful in what it does, but it has no way of investigating or pronouncing conclusions about the supernatural. Right? What science, when scientists do this, obviously they're working in the domain of philosophy and not science, right? And then that becomes bad philosophy or bad science, okay? So this is the conclusion then I would like to make. Uh, just a few more thoughts and then uh, we'll go to the video. Here is the conclusions from the study that I have done. Whatever view you hold, whether it is young earth theory or old earth theory, remember that does not challenge your sincerity as a Christian. I cannot question your sincerity as a Christian, whether you are an old earther or a young earther. A very important conclusions to make. Whatever you, you view you hold, you know, you present the evidence and you look at the evidence and if you believe that is true, fine. But stop attacking others and stop condemning others. That is not right and that is not Christian. All right? We learn and we need to accommodate one another without any challenge to our faith. Do not try to undermine somebody else's faith. Just because I don't understand three days and three nights, whether it is 72 hours or not 72 hours. And some people go on the bandwagon and try to show that, oh, all the Christians are worshipping the false God. How foolish can they be? Right? And that was not meant by the Bible. Okay? Uh, we may disagree. You may be a young author. I may be an old author. Whatever. But we should not be disagreeable. All right. Christians do not need to feel 
that faith requires a 6,000 year old theory or a six day creation, literal six day creation theory or a gap theory or any other theory. Please let us not try to squeeze uh, scientific precision into Genesis chapter one. Do not do that. That is not what it was meant for. You are violating the very purpose of Genesis chapter one if you try to inject scientific precision into it. And finally, this debate is not a salvation issue. It doesn't affect your Christian living or Christian unity, or shouldn't rather, it shouldn't. Nor is it essential to understand God's creative power or, or his inspiration of the Bible. One last thought let me leave you with, and that is this. When we teach our children, and as our children grow up and they are, you know, uh, introduced to and uh, exposed to scientific data, help them to understand that when they read science, that they recognize it as science. And when they read the Bible, that they need to recognize it as a theological perspective. It is not a scientific perspective, right? Because that way we can protect them from unnecessarily getting into this debate and some of them even not coming to faith because they think that science is against the Bible and hence the Bible is mythology. And we have to be careful that we don't do that. All right. Okay. I'm going to stop there and I'm very quickly going to go to the video and we will have some time for discussion. This video is by uh, a scientist called Hugh Ross, Dr. Hugh Ross, titled How Long Are the Creation Days? It's just a small clip of a longer video and he's answering questions. And so the video begins with a question. And uh, I may want to mention that he is an old author. All right. And he is trying to explain the debate that takes place amongst Christians. And interestingly, he wrote a book with 20 different creation accounts. Can you imagine that he could actually look at the Bible and see 20 different creation accounts? And uh, or he, he definitely tells us how it's very important how you read it, right? And interestingly enough, he also concludes the way I did, it has nothing to do with salvation. Let's roll the video and then come back for a discussion. I was listening to your 73-minute um, broadcast from your internet site, and you'd mentioned about the idea of God's days, as he mentions, one day after the other in Christian faith, or I've always held on to it being one 24-hour day after the other, and you describe the idea of one day being significantly longer, just as we're talking now, and you'd mentioned about the Hebrew terms, which I've never seen the Hebrew Bible or don't know any Hebrew per se, <clears throat> but you've made me really curious in terms of what is the term and how is it that, uh, that this actually fits with the verbiage of the original Hebrew scripture so that it, it'll help me to go, oh, okay. And I'm not tense about it. Actually, I'm quite relaxed because of the fact you're putting together brilliant science and I've got that kind of background not brilliant scientist, but I've got, uh, you know, st st strength in this area. And so I look forward to helping me understand better about the scriptural verbiage that makes that day be as long as obviously it must be. Sure. Um, well, I'm going to give you a brief answer, but if you want the long answer, it's in this book, A Matter of Days. It was released just this past June. And I wrote the book uh, with the intent of trying to bring some resolution to this debate within the Christian church. Are the days in Genesis 1 24-hour periods uh, or long periods of time? Now, you're right. The word yom that's translated day in Genesis 1 has a variety of literal definitions. Actually, four. It can mean the portion of the daylight hours, all of the daylight hours, the 24-hour period, or a long but finite period of time. And incidentally, that's common to uh, nouns in the Hebrew language. Uh, the word earth that you see in Genesis 1 has five different literal definitions. The word heaven has three different literal definitions. And it's simply the result of the fact that in biblical Hebrew, there are very few nouns. 
So whatever nouns you have, they have to do multiple duty. And in biblical Hebrew, the only word you have to describe a long, finite period of time is that word yom. So if Moses wanted to describe a long period of time, it's the only word he could have used. Now, you heard in my uh, talk how there are 20 major creation accounts in the Bible. Uh, what we do in this book is we take you through those 20 accounts. Because the position we take at Reasons to Believe is that you want to take the Bible both literally and consistently. And so our problem with the 24-hour view is that you've got the 20 different creation accounts contradicting one another. Uh, but if it's six consecutive long periods of time, then all 20 creation accounts uh, are consistent. Now I'll give you a couple of examples. It tells us in Genesis 1 that in terms of the creation of human beings, both the male and the female were created on creation day six. But in Genesis chapter two, the second account of creation, we we're told that Adam was created first outside of the Garden of Eden, then God placed him in the Garden of Eden, and then God had him work the Garden of Eden so that he could learn about the physical creation. Then after that, God told him to name all the birds and mammals in the Garden of Eden so he can learn about that part of creation that's both physical and soulish, birds and mammals being creatures that have mind, will, and emotions. Then God put Adam to sleep, took a biopsy from his side, allowed him to recover from the operation, and he woke up and was introduced to a brand new creature that, like him, was body, soul, and spirit. And in Genesis 2, it actually states the word that came out of the uh, Adam's mouth. It's the Hebrew word hapam. And everywhere else it's used in the Old Testament, it's translated at long last. So several Bible scholars have concluded this isn't a few microseconds at the end of a 24-hour day, rather it's the passage of several weeks, months, maybe even years between the creation of Adam and the creation of Eve. Therefore, the sixth day must be a long period of time. Now, the thing that persuaded me at age 17, reading the Bible for the first time, is that when you look at Genesis 1, you've got an evening and a morning for the first six days. But there's no evening and morning for the seventh day. I looked for it and it wasn't there. Well, the evening and morning minimally would be bracketing the beginning and the ending of each creation day. So it told me day seven, though it had a beginning, had not yet finished. And it's that period of time when God rests from his work of creation. And when I read Genesis 1 at age 17, for me it answered the enigma of the fossil record. When we look before humanity, we see an abundance of scientific evidence for speciation. But after humanity, we don't see any. Well, for six days God creates. On the seventh day he rests. That's why we don't see anything happening now. But that tells us that the seventh day also is a long period of time. And if you want 18 more biblical arguments, then you'll have to get the book. But uh, what I try to do in the book is I finish it off with a set of predictions, saying if the young earth model is correct, this is what scientists and theologians will discover in the next 12 to 18 months. But if the old earth model is right, then the next 12 to 18 months, they will discover opposite things. And so we wait 12 to 18 months and we see whose predictions have come true. Then we can move on to the next church splitting controversy that's got no bearing on salvation doctrine. <laughs>
in the right. in the beginning in the beginning was the word and the word was god with god yeah what how does that relate uh, i'm not i didn't understand your question mm. uh, uh, i i don't know somewhere uh, that that original crea- uh, i don't know if it's in john or maybe i'm confused <laughs> there, there is an uh, original creation described and this tohu and bohu was the genesis one where the god is now refreshing everything Uh, no I, i i can't recollect anything in john or uh, i'm not sure if others have any thoughts on that uh, but uh, yeah, maybe i'm confused <laughs> <laughs> yes but yes this, the gap theory is a, is a is a you know famous theory where they say that god created and yeah. then it went into you know uh, this uh, form without form without void but that even that explanation is different with different theologians Uh, some people do not believe that it you know was literally without form uh it, some people believe that it had no purpose yet and so god then the spirit was hovering over and god then started bringing purpose to the actual creation so that is how some people explain it but then you know once again uh we don't have enough information to make definitive state okay Vanessa go ahead okay. now about the old earth and the new earth now uh, when god created the earth did he give a language to be spoken what language was spoken by adam and eve and then they came a time they came a time when the the people tried to build the tower to reach heaven and then god through his anger he changed all the languages everybody had spoken a different language okay now there also says a time when there was noah and the ark so only noah his family and the animals were there okay so that means all all the things that told us about the earth and how it was created and about abraham and all those things then where is that information did noah t- take all that information also into his ark so how was the bible created how did it start so who who has who knows this information so if god himself knows that i am giving this much information i am giving a brain to to a human and he is going to of course question he is going to uh, his mind is going to become maybe even greater than maybe the evil one so so <laughs> don't you think there will come a time when when of course somebody is going to be greater than maybe uh, satan or maybe greater than god doesn't he have that fear <laughs> okay well <laughs> you're extra extrapolating so many things but just make a brief comment one is you said what language did adam speak some would like to believe it was hebrew others would like to believe it was sanskrit <laughs> all right so i don't know the bible doesn't say now the question is you are saying who recorded all of this uh, we know that the author is moses so moses may, came much after abraham and noah and all the others and obviously we would like to believe that god gave him the information to for this to be recorded all right but uh, that's as much as i can say i'm not sure about who is going to be more powerful or god is afraid of somebody becoming more powerful i i, I didn't get that uh, when i said i'm sorry <laughs> no he knows he knows that that uh, he is giving so much of uh, power in thought we are we are creating so many new things we are getting so much of power isn't he afraid that it is going to affect <laughs> i mean the the creation his creation okay maybe you are uh, assuming or rather referring to the fact that today we have so much of scientific information that we are going to take over god <laughs> right and yeah god... and we are going to destroy ourselves okay okay 
remember i said god is sovereign and uh, nobody can challenge god there is you know we don't believe in this theory of uh, of duality you know where good and evil are or are, are what you say equal in you know opposing forces we don't believe that that is duality all right uh, we believe god is supreme and there can be nothing that can challenge him all he has to do is pull the plug you know in case there is anybody trying to challenge him so uh, no god is uh, has no fear of uh, any kind of challenge him because nobody can challenge everything is created by him uh, he remains uncreated so that's as much as i can offer anybody else want to venture an answer to that or any thoughts that you can add please go ahead okay um if uh, if i understood uh, um Vanessa? Vanessa. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, okay. I was on a single window mode, so I couldn't see the name. Yeah, Vanessa. Um, there is a verse in Daniel chapter 2, 22. Yeah. Okay. I'll read it out to you, Vanessa. It says, he reveals, meaning the Lord reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. And also, just to add more to it, Deuteronomy 29, 29 also says the secret things belong to the Lord. So I believe there is nothing that is totally revealed. We have yet much to learn. There is still much. People have sent, are sending probes and probes. Like in the scientific fact, if you want to see, I am a space buff. So I can tell you this with a little bit of authority that um, there is a space probe called the Voyager 1 and the Voyager 2, which have been sent years and years ago. Now they have begun to, they have left solar system now and, and kind of are going into the, where the, it's something is something called the Oot cloud, okay, mm -hmm. uh, beyond the solar system and beyond. Now they have reached, having so many years, like about uh, maybe 30 years or something like that. I'm not yet sure, not very uh, uh, clear about the, the year, but you can Google this, yeah, Voyager 1, Voyager 2. They've just begun to scratch it and they've realized that there is much more to this and the Hubble telescope and all we keep seeing, right? So there's much for us. The science will never will be able to fully actually reveal all that the Lord has made. So we will always fall short. We will always fall short because the secret things belong to the Lord. He is the one who made, there are something called as star diggers, which are micro microscopic living things that are found. We can't see them. Everything seems dead on Mars, on this and that. But those are those microbes which live. How do we know? Now we're beginning to realize. So I don't think humans will ever surpass uh, that much knowledge to become, even though we have eaten the fruit of, what is this, <laughs> knowledge of good and evil. We will never co come to a place where we can differentiate sometimes evil and uh, what is good and evil and that is why also we falter and we sin and that is exactly where the lord jesus comes in and steps in and he says it's okay you know so it is for us all to understand that not all things we may delve a little bit more we can question a thing and things like that but when you feel that things are going into the gray as children of the lord we should say lord i don't understand this but in your time i'm sure it will be revealed so I will say that then I, the other thing I wanted to uh, comment upon was through this creation controversy ka Bible studies, the flat earthers will be very happy Whether flat earth or round earth. We, our salvation anyway is with the Lord is because of Jesus. Nothing to do with how many days, how many years, what and that. So I wanted to say now flat earthers who listen to Pastor Dan can say, yes, I believe in flat earth. Okay, Baba. God bless you. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, that's an interesting point that you made, uh, Shanti, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, that nobody can challenge God. If I can just mention that God made himself most vulnerable and yet people couldn't conquer him. And that is Jesus Christ, who allowed himself to be killed by humanity and yet the grave could not hold him. So, you know, God Almighty you know, can be challenged in that regard. 
Bertram, go ahead. Uh, I think it's I think it's in the book of Proverbs where it mentions there is no plan or wisdom or counsel that can succeed against the Lord. Yeah. Yes, I think uh, is it in Proverbs or uh, yeah, probably. I think it's in Proverbs. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Any other thoughts? I hope I didn't uh, sort of uh, shake your. Uh, scientific uh, theories that you may have built uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> it uh, really makes uh, no difference you know as far as faith is concerned right right one right. Thing thought i would like to share yeah Praveen, go ahead. Uh, especially when we look at genesis and all nowadays we are becoming so aggressive uh, to read it scientifically and other stuff in other ways, but I, I would like to look at it in a more theological perspective. And in fact, uh, to an extent you, which you, you have already uh, mentioned that. When Moses wrote, he did not think about uh, the goal of Moses writing, behind writing the five books is not to prove that there is a God who exists. Because in his world, there are there were already other religions, pagan religions are there, and all those religions are already believing in the existence of God. And these religions, they're believing in some deities. And all these religions also have creation accounts. And most of the most common uh, creation account uh, of all these re religions is the re account which we find in the Bible. This is the same in uh, Akkadian and uh, uh, Sumerian and then Jewish. So, so many things are there. This is one of the most common creation accounts. Here, the purpose of Moses, as I said, is not to prove there is a God who exists, but his main purpose is he is taking the children of Israel from a land which was into pagan uh, worship of pagan deities and who are in worship of animals and creation and uh, natural forces. And he is taking them to another land which is also full of these. Okay, so the focus behind writing these is to help these children of Israel, no matter what kind of uh, place you are going, you are surrounded by all this belief where people are worshipping the creation. So he is writing the creation account to prove that there is, uh, we are worshipping the creation and he is not taking just uh, he is something only intuition or something only he, re he got revealed. I'm just reading it uh, through the theory called JDP theory, okay? Uh, so uh, he's he wanted to prove them. You, you see this religion, if you take their creation account, their also creation is created by God. If you take that religion, it is created by God. So all these religions also tell that worshiping the creation is foolishness. And there is only one behind all this creation, that is the God of, uh, who heard you, who came, and uh, he is the one who has authority, and he proved that, number one, by creating the nature, and number two, by manipulating the nature, or we can see, that is through the plagues, and it, by dividing the Red Sea, and what all the miracles they have faced. So through all these, he wanted to connect them to the God who is behind the creation, and who is able to control the creation, and he wanted to encourage them to take them uh, to uh, stop worshiping the creation and worshiping the creator, uh, start worshiping the creator. And second, one last thought from that is most of the deities in these religions are they are very close. If you want, to, they is literally used to feel if they have fever and uh, they feel like okay, here this uh, uh, Im image or thing is there. Here the power is there. If you go there, it will be it will be gone these kind of things are there so he really wanted to bring those uh, people from that cultic beliefs to more into uh, believe uh, worshiping the god who is above and beyond everything and still who is related to you and working in your personal life that is the thing he wanted to connect and he is taking help of the revelation god gave He's showing the miracles and things what happened in the Exodus. And he's showing other religions also. Look at these people also. They also have, but still they are blind to their own teachings. 
and these are the things he wanted to show so he uh, he took that and expressed that way that's how we can think about us thank you thank you praveen sorry we went slightly over time but uh, i think it was interesting uh, uh, discussion uh, i i plan to have one more uh, session on this in this series creation controversies maybe we'll talk a little bit about theory of evolution uh, and the different perspectives even even christians now are talking about evolution uh, you know theistic evolution so we maybe we'll discuss that one you know uh, and uh, uh, anything butram you wanted to say something no i was just uh, thinking of another verse in proverb comes to mind yeah where uh, god says uh, the proverb is an abomination to the lord but his secret is with the righteous his secret is with the righteous oh okay. uh, okay. yeah so yeah god does reveal to us and uh, helps us uh, 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 in the in the in the building us up in the faith right which okay. we of course are received through jesus christ right thank you bertie let me give the last word to our resident scientist uh, franklin poppins uh, franklin do you have any last uh, last word <laughs> on creation and uh... but uh, sir but you summed it up excellently sir uh, science and the theology are dealing with two different realities and then your conclusion sir science does not uh, cannot answer the questions what is love what is relationship it cannot answer the question uh, salvation they are outside its domains sir. am right. i right sir absolutely yeah <laughs> yeah thank you frankly yeah so sir, the the purpose of university is to bring unity among diversity okay okay we we have us disciplines try to answer the how young is the earth. that's right. the purpose that is the purpose of university sir so we have to bring pull up all sir science metaphysics and theology only then we will be able to arrive at an answer the bible gives you the big pictures the macro picture yeah it and why it was but it does not tell how it was done uh, you concluded it excellently so i concur with you thank you thank you franklin i think there sachin you have a thought yeah i am so glad and relieved that creation can be kept out of apologetics <laughs> <laughs> i am happy <laughs> on on the lighter note adam spoke hebrew tell everyone everyone will be so happy it makes my father in law so happy so <laughs> on a lighter note <laughs> there's going to be a a contest between hebrew and sanskrit you know <laughs> on that note uh, sachin may i request you to close in prayer yes just just a, just a comment mr zakra okay uh our, our, our salvation being saved from the bondage of sin and become uh, given the liberty as children of god is secured in jesus christ that gives me a lot of joy secured in jesus christ thank you amen to that amen indeed join me as we pray our father we come before you with thanksgiving indeed you are creator of everything and we just touched how amazingly you have created everything oh lord god no matter what people believe what they put in together but we know you have created and you hold all the keys and our future is secured in your hand knowing that our salvation is secured through the finished work of christ on the cross indeed we want to thank you for this time uh, of learning and we continue to pray that uh, let the holy spirit work in us to uh, open up our understanding uh, and open up our wisdom to to know these things so lord and I want to thank you o lord that through um, pastor zakra you were able to bring uh, this study into us and we want to thank you for this time we continue to uh, remember all of us uh, who are uh, suffering need uh, help in healing o lord I want to thank you for this time and we submit the rest of the evening and all our families and ourselves into your hand thank you and bless you in jesus name we pray amen 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 thank you very much sachin and uh, thank you all for joining us god bless you have a 
lovely rest of the day. God bless you.